Good morning, everybody. Hello, and thank you so much for coming. I'm Chiwe Chihana from Opus Independence. Uh, we're the social enterprise that's behind the Festival of Debate. The festival program runs from the 16th of April to the 25th of May, and it includes over 65 events. We have 140 speakers and 50 partners. So the aim of the festival is to explore the entangled ecological, economic, and political crisis we cur currently collectively face. So there are no easy answers, but we hope the festival creates a space to explore and hold complexity and uncertainty and brings together a community of people to make change where they are. So most of our events are free at the point of access. Where we need to charge, we keep ticket prices as low as we possibly can. If you'd like to make a donation to the Festival of Debate, you can do this by visiting our website, which is festivalofdebate.com. And we want to tell new kinds of stories about the societal challenges and big opportunities for positive change we're seeing through these events. You will get an email asking for your feedback after this event. Please fill it in if you can. That will really be appreciated. So today, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce today's event titled, How Can Young People Shape Systemic Change? Please welcome Hannah Wal Walton, who will be hosting you today, and I'll be in the background should you need anything. Thanks so much, Hannah. Hi, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, it's brilliant to be here today. Um, thank you so much for signing up to come and join us. Um, and yeah, it's a really complex topic, but it's one that really needs to be addressed. And I think the best way to answer how can young people shape systemic change is through young people themselves. Um, and hopefully you'll learn a lot today. Um, we've got some incredible young speakers. Um, they really, just really know what they're talking about. Like they're using all their lived experience. They have been going out into the community um, and creating that change themselves. And they've seen it firsthand. Um, and yeah, I think that's the best way to really get across how we can actually continue this and make proper change. Okay, so um, welcome to the event. Um, so the agenda for today, um, it's meant to be running from 11 till 3. If we finish a bit earlier, then we'll finish a bit earlier. But we really want to give everyone the opportunity to have um, as much time as possible to say what they need to say. And everyone can interact with each other as well. Um, so we want to make sure there's a space for that. So the first bit, we'll be introducing ourselves briefly. Um, we'll just go around to each other and say a qu quick introduction. Um, and then we're going to do a quick icebreaker activity. This isn't as scary as icebreakers are. Um, it's just going to be um, what you currently know about systemic change and young people. Um, and then we'll at the end, we'll also follow up with that and redo it and see how much you've learned from this experience. Um, and then we'll have the wonderful Sophia talking um, and she will be sharing her story. Um, at 12.10, Angel will be doing a wonderful poetry piece. Um, then there'll be a Q&A for those two. Um, and you're welcome to um, put your questions in the chat um, and also on the QR code that will be on screen. Um, at one o'clock, if we're on time, we will have a quick 10 minute break and you can go and grab a drink, go outside, do whatever you need to do. Um, and then we will be straight back um, for Rosella, Sophie and me um, and we will do a Q&A session for us three as well um, and then at the end we will have some final comments revisit the icebreaker and have some thank yous um, yeah and hopefully everyone is fine if you need to leave at any point please do um, this will be recorded and if we need to we can somehow get it to you but um, hopefully you'll stay and you will really enjoy the experience so um, before we do that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we have introductions. So um, I'm just going to go based off my screen. Um, Sophia, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am an award-winning mental health activist and speaker with lived experience. Um, as well as mental health, I am into kind of various other different fields of activism so uh politics uh, uh like environmental stuff uh education those are some of the areas that i'm really passionate about um yeah i have i have i answered all the questions i i think so yeah um so yeah i'm really looking forward to hearing from everyone today yeah amazing um sophie do you want to go next 
Yeah, hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a history student at the University of York. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm a trustee at the Award and Disability Charity, The Lunar Project, which are entirely by young people. And I am also a, an advisor to the Listening Fund. So really excited to be here. Amazing. Um, Angel? Yep. Hi everyone, my name's Angel and my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently a student president at my sixth form college and I'm studying sociology, English literature and philosophy and ethics. Um, a fun fact about me is that I currently hold the title of Miss T Nigeria UK, which is quite a cool fact. Um, I'm really passionate about creating different narratives for young people, people who have been negatively influenced by their environments and that's allowed me to become a member of different youth boards, which you'll hear about later today. Um, and I'll also be performing a spoken word, which I'm really excited about. Thank you. Amazing. Um, and Rosella. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosella. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, it's such an honour. And I'm really passionate about climate action, gender equality and using youth activism to make change. So I currently work at an environmental charity in the UK and I volunteer with youth organisations around the world. Uh, so my background is as in policy, tech and research. Uh, my contribution today will be storytelling. So it's really nice to meet you. Brilliant. Um, and finally, um, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I will be the host, um, but I'm also doing um, a uh, storytelling later. Um, I am 24, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I have run my own youth organisations. Um, I've volunteered, I've done sort of bits and pieces everywhere. Um, and my experience stems from leaving school at 14 um, and really just trying to overcome those barriers and make some change in the process. So um, yeah, enough about me. Um, thank you so much for everyone for introducing yourselves. You're all incredible. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again and hopefully everyone can follow the QR code. Um, so if everyone can follow the QR code, um, if anyone has any problems, please shout out because I can't see you. Um, but hopefully you should all be able to access that. If not, I can put a link in the chat for everyone. And so this activity hopefully everyone has been able to access this. Um, this activity is just basically what you already know about systemic change and also how young people can and influence uh, those changes. So it's very much just a case of pop down what you already know, um, what words come to mind, um, any organisations that you know of. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll sort of see what people know um, and have a quick discussion um, and go through it. So people are putting lots of different ways to do it. Um, there are it, there is also being part of youth organisations and youth steering groups, which is an excellent way of um, creating systemic change. Being part of a community that you all know what you're you're all there for the same reason, and therefore you will have. Um, the shared experiences in that area, but you also come from different backgrounds, so you can all collaborate in, in very different ways. Um, and that's a brilliant way of making change. Um, it's open to everyone. Um, yeah, so regardless of what your background is, your lived experiences are your lived experiences and that makes you unique. And therefore you can just take part in this. Like it's, it really isn't closed off to everyone. Um, and that's a brilliant way of doing it. Um, yeah, and basically the same again. So yeah, so that's what we know so far, um, which is absolutely fine because that is, they're all brilliant ways of getting involved. Um, and yeah, young people um, being part of youth changes um, is brilliant. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide um, and we are going to have Sophia speak first. Um, so I'm gonna turn my mic on mute. Okay, Sophia. Hello, everyone. Okay, wonderful. Um, that's funny. I've just seen it says 22. I'm actually 23 now, but only very recently. So that's okay. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. Um, that's 
yeah, pretty much everything about me is on the slide. Um, but I wanted to talk to you all a little bit today about my, <laughs> thank you, Rosella. <laughs> Rosella just said happy birthday. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you all a little bit about my own uh, social activism journey and yeah, just kind of how I accidentally fell into storytelling and how I it's become a really important part of my life. Um, so essentially I was hospitalized when I was 15 for various different mental illnesses. Um, when I was discharged, I decided that I wanted to speak to my peers in school um, as a kind of assembly um, and just kind of talk about yeah where to get help kind of normalizing um, the idea of mental ill health especially because I went to quite a high achieving quite intense school um, and things were just really brushed in the, under the carpet and I didn't like that narrative at all um, so the first thing I ever did was an assembly um, explaining a little bit about where I had been for the past seven months. There were all kinds of conspiracy theories going on in the school that I've been I'd been sent to India or I'd gotten pregnant or something. And I was like, no, no, I was I was just ill. And this is what I've learned. And this is what I'd like to, to say to you all. Um, that assembly was received so warmly um and it really took me back because I was so nervous it was the first kind of big speaking thing that I'd done and I was also being quite vulnerable um and then from that initial um assembly things just kind of snowballed um I was approached by an organization called Think for Brum um so they're a mental health uh, youth mental health steering board um, for Birmingham Women's and Children's NHS Foundation Trust, uh, which basically means that we help advise and shape youth mental health services in Birmingham. Um, so I joined the board um, and I was the um, diversity and inclusion ambassador um, and lead for a while. Um, and through that organization, I really found ways to use my voice and to kind of yeah just convey a different side to what most people see especially I have a lot of experience um in doing this in clinical settings so in terms of training future doctors and nurses it's it's fascinating because they they have this understanding which is kind of through textbooks and through theoretical things and very kind of yeah just just information and it's it's common for them to understand mental illness on paper I like to say but then actually meeting with them and saying okay this is actually my story this is what I've experienced and these are some things that I wish had been done differently it brings a face and a voice to everything that they've been reading and learning about um, and I find that really powerful kind of yeah the importance of lived experience in these kind of clinical settings and teachings um, yeah so I guess things have kind of snowballed from there I'm now an I will ambassador um, so I've had lots of opportunities there and I think the most important thing for me aside from being able to challenge and change the narratives of kind of like all young people being one homogenous thing that's that's not true we're so multifaceted and multi-talented um yeah so being able to challenge that um has been a really important part of my journey but also meeting different people and kind of finding a community of activists who share the same passions, who challenge me on my ideas. Um, things like that have really, really shaped me into the person that I am today. Um, and I guess I, yeah, my, my main point would be just about kind of finding that confidence within yourself to trust yourself, trust your voice and for what you believe in and what you stand up for. 
um activism doesn't always have to be big and kind of yeah just like huge displays there's so much to activism and so much to shaping systemic change that happens behind the scenes as well as kind of at, at the front so within activism and kind of youth voice and social change within this space there are so many different roles for everyone um I would recommend to anyone to get involved in a cause that you're passionate about um reach out to people that's one of my favorite things to do um yeah kind of just sending emails out and saying hmm, I noticed this and as a young person I don't think this you know or I I think this would be better just really kind of taking on that active citizen role is really important um it's taught me a lot about myself about the world I've met some incredible people um and I think for my self-confidence, I'd say that was the most important thing because I'm now able to sit and do events such as these and talk about myself, which for a long time was like the scariest thing that I could do. Um, but also about the things that I'm passionate about and know how to channel my passion into ways to actually facilitate change. Um, yeah, I, I believe in the power of youth. I believe young people have the power to change the world. We're not just the leaders of tomorrow. We're also the leaders of today. Um, and I guess through all my work, that's what I try to emphasize and try to encourage young people to have more faith in themselves, um, to trust in their own stories and their own experiences. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've covered everything. <laughs> um, if there's anything else, Hannah, you'd like me to touch upon, just let me know. <laughs> no, that was brilliant. Um, yeah, um, you're you're amazing. Your experiences are incredible. Um, and I think that was definitely really valuable. Um, really valuable, valuable, I can't speak today. Really valuable advice um, for anyone watching. Um, yeah your experiences are amazing um and i think you've covered everything and that was brilliant um so um i have um i hope everyone really enjoyed that um we are running ahead of time and i have just realized why um i was actually meant to do another um icebreaker so um bear with me um if you can follow the qr code again um, you should now see a page um, that says, how confident do you feel about young people? Um, how, how confident do you feel about young people? Can she? I spelt that wrong. Um, so bear with me on that. But um, yes, um, basically, this is just a sliding scale of how confident you feel about these different statements. Um, so there's, I understand what systemic change is. Um, there are different ways that young people can contribute to systemic change. Um, young people possess the power to influence systemic change. Barriers can hinder young people in changing systems and successful examples show young uh, youth driving systemic change. Um, so if you could pop on there and just slide it to whatever you feel comfortable with. Obviously, we've already heard from one incredible speaker. And um, so you may feel a bit more confident now than you may have at the start. But I think it's still a good sort of, a good um reference point um so when we do finish this session and you've heard everyone's experiences and everyone's different um takes on what systemic change is and how you can get involved um i think that will be brilliant to come back to um yeah and just so you can you can then see in yourself what you've gained from this um and if you know any more or feel more confident about this um so i'm gonna leave that page up on the mentimeter um for a little bit so just while people are filling that in um we can get ready for angels um incredible performance um so we'll give we'll give the voting about one more minute and then we'll get started with angels everyone's feeling pretty confident which is really good And there's definitely some fours in there so we can we can get that to a five hopefully by the end of the session
Brilliant. Okie doke. Right. So, um, Angel, if you're ready, um, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to start with a short spoken word poem that I wrote earlier this morning. That just I just wanted to write it. So okay, this is how it goes. My favourite flavour of ice cream is justice sprinkled in hope. It's the taste of equity in the air. It's the icicles of young people marching to the rhythm of equality. It's the power we fail to recognise. We, with, we withhold with our might. Like a comb protesting the marginalised, the isolated, alone, but as strong as a stone. What's your favourite ice cream? So as part of my discussion, I just want to share a bit about my life with you. So I'm not really sure how many people have had a positive or negative experience within the education system, but I'm just going to tell you a bit about my experience. So in my early years of secondary school, I was in a very predominantly white environment where I faced a lot of racial abuse and discriminations from teachers and students. This really affected my mental health and self-esteem and confidence and I ended up moving schools, which was very hard, especially being like a community for such a long time. But fortunately, my secondary school provided me with a lot of support and they encouraged me to participate in spoken word competitions. They encouraged me to speak in assemblies and really build my confidence. And I definitely wouldn't be where I was today without that nurturing from my school. I ended up becoming an ambassador for change at my secondary school and also held the position of my school's parent laureate. I then was able to work with Royal Shakespeare Company in creating a spoken word short film on diversity, which is actually now in an exhibition in Stratford. And a lot of the experiences that I felt within the education system of feeling, you know, the idea of unjust and inequality, it led me to apply to become a member of the Fair Education Alliance Youth Styling Group. And that's where we work on tackling education inequality within the education system and we work on policies and also talking to politicians and MPs and people in charge to allow youth voices to be heard and I think that's really important. Um, another thing for me about like working on systematic change as a young person is that growing up I always felt like I didn't really fit into the UK's beauty standard. I always felt that I guess I wouldn't be enough and for me, that was really sad, not just for myself, but for other like young black girls. I wanted to become a role model for them so that they would be able to also like look at themselves and like not be, I don't know, um, boxed in by the stereotype of someone else's beauty standards that shouldn't really apply to them. So that led me to become an ambassador for the Dress Studio UK, which was like I think it's the number one prom dress store in the UK. And I worked on creating social media content for them. And just, it was really nice to be able to be a role model for other young black girls. And that's something that was really important for me and also just my childhood as well. I also later ended up entering a pageant called Miss Teen Nigeria UK, which was in London. And I ended up winning and that was really amazing for me. Um, I was really able to work on my confidence and it was just such a good opportunity to compete against some really amazing people. It was just really great. And yeah, but for me, that wasn't really enough. Obviously it was great, but I wanted to carry on doing things. I wanted to carry on um, campaigning and being an advocate for other young girls and being a role model. So. I thought about things that affected me in my childhood and throughout my life I've always been I guess cautious about knife crime and the epidemic and how um, bad that has been on young people around me so I started advocating against it I started creating campaigns I started talking to um, schools and primary schools and organizations to see how I can make a difference in my community and I ended up joining the Nottinghamshire Youth Commission, which focuses on improving relations between the police and young people, as well as policy making. And I just want to say, like, you're probably thinking, why is she sharing all this information? But for me, I just want to say that it's the small things that matter. For young people to create systematic change, we have to first make changes in our local communities, in our areas, even within our schools. And the most important thing is that if you want to create change, it needs to be something that's close to your heart, not just something that you're seeing on the news. It has to be something that you really want to change because it's affected you. I think that's 
the probably the easiest way to make change and I think something that's really important and I was touched by before was that you don't have to be going to Westminster you don't have to be a politician you don't have to be in parliament to make change it can be in anything that you're passionate about so for me I talked to you before about how I am doing spoken word for me the spoken word way of Royal Shakespeare Company that's something that I'm really passionate about and for me that's an example of creating change it doesn't have to be that I'm you know talking to Rishi Sunak every day it's just the little things that really do matter and yeah and I'm just gonna finish with um one last poem that I also wrote earlier that made me when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today I just summarized it into this poem so it goes like this be the change you'd like to see. Do not allow people to influence your dreams. In this moment, I sense the future lies here. The next MPs, lawyers, judges, activists, decision makers, dancers. It's when society imprisons your aspirations. When we ignore injustice, we turn a blind eye to inequality. That is when the idea of change becomes mythology. That's it. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, honestly, your performances are incredible. Um, and I think you touched on so many really vital points there that um, systemic change mostly comes from if you've had a personal experience of a cause and your experiences of that make you want to do something about it. Um, that's definitely the way that I think a lot of us have got into um, systemic change and um, activism. Um, so yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, I couldn't have put it better myself, to be honest. Um, so yeah, um, I hope you've really enjoyed Angel's um, pieces and also her discussion on her, um, her own youth activism. Um, we are really ahead of schedule. Um, and I really overestimated um, how much we were going to do on the sorry, how much we were going to do on um, the icebreakers. But that is absolutely fine because now we have plenty of time, more than enough time, um, to do some Q and A sessions um, with Sophie, Sophia, and Angel. Um, so if you want to put it in the chats um, or follow the link, um, I actually won't be able to see the chat though is the only thing um if you can follow the link please do because i will be able to see the questions that come through from that um but we already have some questions that have come through um so um let's start with angel um from your experience um, what opportunities exist for young people to engage with and influence decision makers um at local, national and international levels? Okay, thank you. I'd say in terms of local, I'd say for young people, if you are in schools, that is definitely the first step. There's always, you know, school councils, diversity ambassadors. There's so many opportunities, I'd say, that not in every secondary school, that's the only unfortunate thing. But if your school does have, you know, a school council, I'd say join it. Just it's it gives you a taste of what it's like to just be able to like speak and communicate in a group of young people who also are advocating for similar things to you. And I think that's a great start. Um, I'd say national level, I think, like youth steering boards. I think that's just been so amazing for me. Like the first youth steering board I was in was the Nottinghamshire Youth Crime Commission. And it was just amazing being able to just talk to other young people who are also really passionate and driven to make a change in the systems that we are in. I think that's really important. It just allows you to see things from different perspectives and it's amazing. Um, yeah, youth steering boards, I know that Youth Parliament recently closed down, which is unfortunate, but there are other organisations which also are driven to empowering young people. So I'd say definitely research into them. There's also a lot of like social media accounts which work on sharing a lot of opportunities. So for example, Reach Out to All is a really good one for that. Just trying to get involved, I guess. I think that's the most important thing. Amazing. Um, Sophia, do you have any extra comments for that? Sorry, I didn't realise I was on mute. Um, no, that's that's a fantastic overview. That's basically everything I was gonna say. Um, 
yeah just the point about youth parliament i know that the british youth council has closed I'm not sure about the youth parliament yet but i think the whole youth space is yeah it's it's been a big shock for the youth social action space and that's why we need more young people than ever um to really kind of yeah raise the flag and talk about the issues that are affecting us absolutely um and i i completely resonate with that the um uh, the british youth council closing was a massive shock to so many young people um i didn't work directly with them but i did a, a keynote speaking um for one of their conferences it would have been about two years ago now maybe three years ago um and i know so many young people were actively involved in that um and their processes and programs and yeah i, I think that is a really good example of what we need to stop um we need to encourage young more more young people to get involved um and so we can demonstrate that the funding really is needed in that area um to continue everything and keep it growing um brilliant answers um we have another question um and that question is um how do you think young people can leverage social media and digital platforms and um, to amplify their voices um, and we'll go to Sophia for this first, if that's all right. Okay. Um, yeah, social media is one of my favorite things to use. Um, one of my favorite tools to use in terms of kind of getting people to listen. Um, there's loads of fun ways, kind of fun dances, TikToks, fun trends that we can do to kind of really bring yeah bring awareness um of what it is that we're doing um and also just the the sheer reach in terms of social media is so so cool it blows my mind every day um one thing i had to learn about social media the hard way but i guess two things number one is that there will always be people who disagree with you that's fine you know like comments are comments and there might be people saying some inappropriate and not very nice things um but I guess that's just what comes with using such an open and public platform. Um, the the second thing is that content doesn't have to be perfect. I used to spend hours and hours editing reels, wanting to make sure that like the music matched up to the sound and and the like the changes of things. And it's honestly you could spend half your life trying to make content perfect content doesn't have to be perfect the whole point is that it's real and it's showing what what it is like to be a youth activist and kind of the issues that are important to you um so i think social media is an amazing tool um and i try to use it as much as i can that being said i don't um kind of yeah i don't spend so much of my time on it that I kind of get caught in this little um, bubble of like, oh, everything has to be perfect. Um, I think the most meaningful and impactful um, things that I've seen on social media have been about it not being perfect and kind of just real life. Um, so yeah, so I do love using social media as a platform um, I think it's also important to have that realistic element and also to curate your social media feeds um, so that you're consuming the right amount, the, the correct content, content that doesn't make you feel bad about yourself, um, but also that challenges you. I think that's really important. Amazing. Um, that was a brilliant answer. Angel, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think that was covered amazingly. Um, I agree. I think with social media, it can be a bit tricky because, like, for me personally, I did quite struggle with kind of being obsessed with it. Like, I was, there was a time when I was just constantly always on it. And you do sometimes have to realise that social media isn't everything. And sometimes it's okay to take a step back and be like, 
okay, maybe I'm not going to go on social media for one hour, two hours today or something like that. I think that's quite important for young people, but also using social media as a tool. It is a great, amazing tool to get opportunities and also, I don't know, to connect with people who you might not normally speak to or other youth activists. I think that's really amazing about social media. So there's definitely positives and negatives um, when it comes to activism and yeah. Definitely. Um, both brilliant answers. Um, we had another question come in. Um, we'll probably do this question, then another question after then, and then we, we should be back on schedule um, a little bit anyway. Um, so uh, this goes out to both of you. Um, so whoever wants to answer first. Um, do you feel that there's a lack of youth voice, um, like uh, dem in terms of demographics, backgrounds or types of young people? Do you think there are any missing from these conversations. So yeah, I guess it's just in case of location, um, uh, types of causes, that type of thing. Um, anyone who wants to jump in? Yeah, I think there's always gonna be voices missing, which is really annoying actually. I think that right now in terms of UK, I think the problem for a lot of youth organizations is funding, because if we did have the correct funding, there wouldn't really be any voices missing because everyone, I think everyone from like areas which are usually like so far away, like I've got a friend who lives in like a village that I've never heard of. And it's that type of thing where it's like, what youth organisations are there? What youth organisations are providing funding for those people to be going to events in like London, for example, or Birmingham. And I think that type of thing is why a lot of youth voices are missing. And it's just maybe in terms of social media, sorry using social media again but in terms of social media how we could utilize social media to engage young people from all backgrounds and all ethnicities and all areas so no no one's feeling left out or that their voice doesn't matter because of where they live or because that's not really their fault yeah I definitely agree with that it can be a postcode lottery um especially I think the further north you go and the further kind of out of big cities and into more rural areas you are um it can be incredibly hard to find social action um opportunities and also to be able to join things in like big cities um i always say that youth voice is always out there so there are always young people who want to speak to you about issues that are important to them um no one is hard to reach um it, it, it's a term we hear a lot especially in healthcare it's kind of oh these are hard to reach communities they're not hard to reach we're just doing a bad job at reaching out to them um and I definitely think more needs to be done to engage these people Angel is right it comes down to funding a lot of the time um but also I think especially in the youth activism space, and this is something that I've become more conscious of recently, is that we're hearing the same voices quite often. And a lot of times, especially if I get an opportunity, I have to think to myself, okay, am I the best person to do this? Or is there someone else within my network who I know would do a better job um, and has more experience in this field and maybe hasn't had as many opportunities to use their voice? um yeah it's it's an incredibly complex issue definitely postcode lottery is one of them um also minority and ethnic backgrounds um I know especially within the so specifically within kind of mental health and um which is what I know the most about I guess um but also specifically eating disorder um recovery and awareness I very much um needed to see someone who looked like me um in these spaces when I was in recovery and when I was unwell um so yeah I guess it's just about awareness um reaching out to young people whose voices aren't heard whether they're in rural areas from minoritized backgrounds also maybe don't believe in themselves enough I think that's that's a big thing it's this cycle of oh I don't live in a great area, school isn't great, I'm not going to amount to anything. And we really have to challenge that narrative because young people are capable of so much. It's not just 
the fancy ones who go to like fancy schools and whatever every single young person has so much potential um yeah I hope that answered the question yeah definitely I think that definitely answered the question um sorry my mouth has gone dry um no that was a brilliant answer um I'm just gonna just we have one more question that we can ask um and again it's up to you who goes first um uh um in what ways have you found solidarity and support within communities um of other young people with similar lived experiences i'm happy to go first if that's okay um so i always say that being around as a youth activist gives me so much energy it can be an incredibly exhausting world and life in general um especially if you're an activist because you're so much more aware of all the things that are wrong and all the spaces that need investment and time and energy put into them. Um, but just spending time with other youth activists who who challenge me, who share the same views as me, who have the same passion and energy and drive, that gives me energy. And it's a huge motivator for me, not just in my ongoing mental health recovery, um, because I know that I can't help people and do the things that I love and meet the people that I love if I'm not well, um, but also in general for, for life, especially when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, I find comfort and solidarity in the community of young people who I know and who who are in the same boat as me and we can all relate and I am so grateful to the community that I found and that I'm so honored to be a part of um because you just meet the most incredible people and you see things from a perspective that you maybe wouldn't have been exposed to before um in what ways yeah I guess um organizations such as I will um they have been instrumental in introducing me to other social activists um they have like online meetups and things it's also lovely when you go to an event um, especially if it's in person and you see someone who you've seen on social media or you've kind of had contact with through another person and it's like, oh, I know you, like, I, I know you from this and I really admire your work. And just, yeah, it gives me a lot of hope, I think, that there are young people out there who share the same passion and enthusiasm and drive as me and that I'm not alone in trying to change the world because I don't think one person can change the world by themselves. It's, it's, um into I can't remember the word but yeah like everyone everyone has to work together and it brings me a lot of comfort to have such a community yeah no that, that was really great um I think I would just add that I guess my living example as well um doing like this spoken word program with like I think nine of the young people and everyone else is from Coventry and I was from Nottingham but I had this community of like guess people who would live similar experiences as me but also who wanted to express how they felt through spoken word and I think that was really important to find like those similarities and see how you can like work together and it really allowed me to see things from different perspectives as you said and yeah I think that is really important for young people to be able to be in a community of people who are also interested because it is exhausting if you're the only person trying to make a change and it is good sometimes you know to feel like that that you want to make a change but it's great to find people who are also like-minded and I think youth staying groups and youth councils do that really well. Exactly. Um, I couldn't have put it better myself. Um, they're both brilliant examples. Um, communities are really difficult to put into words sometimes because everyone has such different experiences. So it's, it can be quite difficult finding that right community that really supports you. Um, but I think, like you said, you've managed to find those little niche communities um, in different areas. And often it's okay to have 
multiple communities you don't have to have one that fits everything because it's likely that you'll um i don't know be um in a local community um but they won't have had the same experiences as you um everyone is completely different so yeah i think they're brilliant answers um and again it's very personal to um yourself um and the people around you as well we're going to have a very quick 10 minute break um please feel free to go grab a drink a snack um open a window um do whatever you need to do um right i think everyone's now back um so uh let's get started um with rosella thanks so much hannah and firstly thank you so much for having me here today there's so much that i want to share and talk to you about so apologies if anything's unclear and let me know if i'm jumping around at all too much um and for anyone who jumped joined a little after the introductions and um, so i'm rose ellen my pronouns are she her and i'm really passionate about youth action particularly for tackling the climate crisis and for uh, gender inequalities. So um, I'm really grateful to be here and be in a space like Hannah said, that's really uplifting and with others who care. I think that's so important. Firstly, to surround yourself with others who care. That's like the first step for me in taking any form of action is being around people who give me that kind of energy. Um, and I also want to say to anyone who's listened to any of our pre the previous speakers who are absolutely incredible or in the next few sections and I think, oh, like that sounds so difficult or something so unlike what I'm doing, I want to like reassure you that my actions, well, like hopefully they've had some impact so far. My story is by no means unique and I hope that there's something small and something right what you could take away from this. So I don't want you to think you have to like completely change your life to get involved in youth action. Because I know Sophia and Angel's like amazing stories show that there's, there's so many different and diverse people involved and I bet you're already doing so much more than you think. Um, and that you, still, you need to know that your story is in whatever space you want to share it um, so it can make it so um, when thinking about what would be most important to share in the address I realised I don't actually need to go into the like why about why you could take action I think we're being and the necessity of having events and spaces like this shows that it's our world around us and it's the reason for our taking action. We will notice things that we have to improve and things that as young people we can actively make like a difference in shaping and, and just noticing that as well as finding like other people who care I think is the really foundations for uh, taking action. Um, and so in terms of my own story there's all I could say. Uh, so I grew up in quite rural England and there's lots of different points I could say where like my story and action began but um, I suppose something I always think about in these sorts of conversations is when um, I started traveling at, like and seeing different places that not necessarily far away could be quite close to me as well but seeing different people and different environments to my own and finding that sense a connection to the world and then when I wrote yeah. returning home and just feeling the urge to protect it and wanting to do all I can to help others connect with their world and connect with their communities around them and and so I studied philosophy originally like I've always asked questions about why this what world is as it is but um realizing that I could take action to this really so far um, and so again when I started to study politics uh, I understood a little bit more for myself around the connection between wanting to take action and the systems and institutions that um, are really critical towards being able to have that change we want and so when I started studying politics uh, before this as well, but particularly this particular moment, I met a lot of barriers in my journey. I think it's pretty important to be honest about them. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions and misinformation out there, um, particularly sexism um, and the belief that like feminism and um, isn't really important or that equality isn't really an issue and um, I think it's quite easy to get disheartened by that if your community thinks a certain way um, and that's something again that was quite important for me is reaching out beyond 
people who had those views and finding others who did think the same way as me and also understanding that a lot of the time root causes of people again for example believing that maybe climate crisis isn't an important issue or that young people like I bet a lot of you might have heard that people should like stay in school or know their place and like not really get involved in issues um uh, it's quite disheartening but I think understanding that a lot of people aren't doing that out of a place of anger they're just doing it out of a disconnect and that shouldn't be something to stop you if anything I've tried to use it as something to me and to try to realize that there's there's more to um tackling like the issues I care about than other people think I can do um and there is such a big world out there and so many opportunities for taking action um and so particularly for me, uh, a few years ago, um, in 2020, during the pandemic, yeah. um, uh, when I was thinking a lot about um, how I could get involved and what kinds of action would be really important to take now that we were all at home and like having such different experiences of what the pandemic meant for us. Um, and for me, uh, I wanted to start playing gender inequalities a lot more. And um, so I was part of the launch of a group called the Femini Carter Initiative. Um, and that was, it was based around the idea of the Magna Carta. That's the name, clue in the name. We wanted to create um, a kind of document and project that involved around the world in advocating for gender equality. Um, so we've like really grown only since then um, and all it started was an idea that we wanted to make change and since then we've had like youth summits in three different continents and we've had connected to international organizations um, and universities in some of some places I never even thought I would be able to have the yeah. privilege to be in and all that is because I was part of that community and I didn't do it on my own and neither did anyone else we did it because we worked together um during that time like during the pandemic years <laughs> as we might call them I would say yeah. joined the transport for London youth plan um again that was something I wanted to do to connect me with my local community at the stage of clubs living in London and um I really was interested in sustainable transport and the role of youth in inclusion and I didn't really know how I could influence that and then I found I found a space for me to do that and I think it does take time at that point I was 21 22 so um it was like a good, a good few years of looking for spaces that made like that made sense to me um that I felt the courage and that I felt respected enough that I could actually make a difference um but it is so like important when you do find community and um, going back to what Sophia said right at the start like finding community has been so important to your own personal journey so just to take a quick pause <laughs> I appreciate I'm just talking a lot to everyone and um, so I want to make this slightly interactive um a bit completely off but I wanted you to just speak to yourself you're welcome to put in the chat if you want. Um, yeah. Also, if you need to just think, that's equally fine uh, in whatever way it helps you engage. Um, and so some of the questions that I think about when I'm trying to look at sustainability action as a young person, or, uh, just youth action in general. Uh, uh, what are my connections with the earth? Or what are my connections with like, a particular issue as a young person? So, like, how do you connect to the world around you? Um, what what has come to your head when you first think about like youth action? Well, do you think other people might think different? Like, do you think that your family or your community might think differently um, about what their words are associated with youth action? And third and finally, what are the main barriers that you feel that you face in communicating your story, uh, particularly in terms of entering the space that they're joining the scene webinar, like what challenges have you faced in being here? Uh, I, I always think it's like a privilege to be able to join spaces like this um, and I'm really mindful that we have such like a great opportunity to have this power in these conversations and I want to hope you this ovens as well uh, that aren't necessarily here in this space right now so um you're welcome to just think about this so if anyone has any comments i can see the chat i don't know if it's possible to put in but yeah you're welcome to drop in messages anytime
Um, um, so, so I wanted to share something quickly um, around other stories, because uh, I think it's already been mentioned by some of the students, but I think it's really important for you to listen to stories that are different from your own. Um, and obviously, by attending this conference, we're already listening to some of the people. But um, I've also taken a step recently in realizing um, how diverse the world is and how many stories there are that can I use to like amplify the work I do. Um, so I'm currently in Brussels this week um, at an eco-feminism conference. And so I've changed what I was going to say slightly because I wanted to share one of the stories I heard yesterday. Uh, and I don't explain how this was only yesterday, so it might not be 100% accurate in the details. But this is the story of Rhodes. It's from Kenya. And in Kenya, um, there are lots of communities that are affected by the climate crisis, and there are people with affected mood. So you might have heard a little around climate refugees, before, or refugees, or people affected by the climate crisis. And I heard something different yesterday that really changed my perception of this, in that when Rose shared her story with me, she said, it's not just individuals that are coming to me, it's their way of life that's changing, and it's their community that's changing. And that really struck me because I think when we typically look at young climate refugees, we're often thinking about that, like, perhaps people are searching for better jobs or moving for education. That slightly ignores the context of why they're moving, where they're coming from, and where they're going, because we have to think more holistically around how the climate crisis is affecting people's traditional practices and their connections to the land. So Rose now lives in Germany, um, and I think from her story, I took away that sense of um, cultural loss and historic loss that really means we have to fight the climate crisis so much more, because if young people are moving away um, and uh, older people are having to change their like, like lifestyle practices and their farming communities um, just because uh, it's no longer sustainable or if they're able to make money from doing that, that's going to change their entire community way of life. And for me, that's really sparked my desire to want to tackle climate, take climate action even more because um, if we can reduce lots of fuels and pollution and dumping and electronic waste and so much more. Um, we can we can shape our futures to the way we want them to be. Um, and we have the opportunity to make an impact in such a long-term way. So as a young person, I think we have such power to connect with other people from different places. Um, and I really want to use that and hopefully encourage you all to use that for good uh, in whatever sense, uh, in whatever spaces you have as well. Um, and so quickly looking at what's next, um, my few, few ideas I had around what would help shape change and use your power to actually make an impact. Um, I think something that's really important to me is that everyone here in this space today recognizes the power of their own story and the power of making space for others to share their too. That's the whole purpose of these conversations. Uh, and people have so many different like stories and conversations and identities and I think it's really important to start conversations to spark action and listen to people with different lived experiences to our own particularly those from the most marginalized groups um, because I think effective action is only really possible by learning and growing constantly um, and I would also say to that I this is a very broad statement, but if you can be like an engaged and democratic citizen, so if you're able to vote, please vote and make an informed vote. And if you're young or from a different area, get involved locally because there are so many ways that action can start wherever you are in your community and whatever spheres you want to influence change, like within your family, your friends, your school, your workplace, even yeah, your local youth centers. There's so much more out there um that I bet you all know uh, in your hearts like where you know you can make change um and so I would also say if you're already doing something like that just keep going because we will support you so much in doing that and it's so powerful that you keep going and um, realize that you have the support of other young people um around the world who you want to encourage you to keep on going with that 
Uh, and so lastly, my own version of like what's next for me in creating systemic change is that a few months ago, I started a small youth-led grassroots project called Climate as Personal, um, because I want to start a small digital space dedicated to sharing personal experiences of the climate crisis and increasing dialogue and conversations for shaping change in an inclusive way, um, because I feel that if we can recognize those local stories and share um, and contribute together, we can really learn and create that better world by working together. So this project's right at the early stages, but if anyone would love to get involved um, or if any part of my story has resonated with you today, um, I'd be really happy to be in touch with anyone. Um, and if there's any way I can help you on your journey too, uh, I want to give back to like the community that we have in the Festival of Debate today as well. So um, I'd be more than happy to help in any way that I can. Um, and so, yeah, at the end, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time listening to me today. And, and I would just like you to know that all these big issues that we're talking about, like education and the climate crisis um, and so like um, all the other mental health issues as well, they're all solvable and achievable by working together and uplifting young people. And I feel that every action really does matter and every story is so important for building this better future. So I'm really excited to be in a space creating change with you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Rosella. Um, it's so good to see just different perspectives. Um, I'm not that into the... Um, the, the climate area and it's an area that I really want to focus on more and so it's really important to be able to hear like you said um people's different stories um what is actually happening um and get more young people involved um I've like like I said I've never really been involved in that area and I really want to um I feel like for me I've not been exposed to it as much and now that I'm in that community um of young change makers i'm seeing it so much more and it really is inspiring um and yeah so please put the link in the chat um for us to get involved um we would love to um but yeah your experiences are incredible thank you so so much um so we are going to move on to sophie if you're ready yeah um, so hi, um, I introduced myself earlier, but I'm a disability activist and I will be doing a spoken word and I might talk about it at the end, but I think it should be fairly self-explanatory. Growing up chronically ill, but I didn't know it, or a broken kaleidoscope full of moments that never should have happened, or it's just growing pains, stop playing basketball, or is that stick really yours or is it your mum's, or wondering if my neck will ever stop hurting, or realising it won't and realising that's okay, or walking out of PE lessons for reasons I can't actually explain, or standing out from everyone else, but I'm not really sure why, or kept awake by burning pain they don't think is real, or a lifelong diagnosis of a lifelong genetic disorder being a relief, or paying thousands of pounds for your own wheelchair, or quoting the Equality Act at my boss, or even knowing the Equality Act well enough to quote it, or doing a GCSE in Spanish but learning medical ease better, or not having a fire evacuation plan at uni, or you're just so resilient that I don't know how I can help you. Running alongside that to say what identity, community pride and joy, the friends who taught me to advocate for myself, or the sheer euphoric joy of meeting a chronically adult for the first time, knowing we get to exist and that it can be beautiful, or relocating a joint and no one bats an eye, or lying on the floor together in public, or the word disabled tasting sweet rather than bitter, or fighting for what I deserve and knowing I deserve it, or the joy of existing with other wheelchair users, or confusing everyone by wheeling into the climbing gym, or falling over and just laughing about it, or the people who feel like coming home. To become disabled in youth is to know what you are but not have the language to explain it. It is to master navigating bureaucratic systems before you master frying an egg, to be stared at and judged and questioned your very existence every single day and run out of jokes for the public. I want to be clear, to become disabled in youth is one of the most profoundly isolating experiences. I want that to be totally out of everything else. I was 15 when I left an appointment with a newer diagnosis and a really mediocre leaflet. I was 15 when I was pushed out to sea and left to drift. Healthcare did not change my life or support me 
or teach me how to manage this predictably unpredictable body. People did. While I could dwell on the injustice of that, I would rather dwell on the people, the community who made me a person again. The people who really truly got it, had been there, were still there. The people who knew how to write an assertive email and the ones who cried at, I cried at when it all just felt so insurmountable. Most of them you will find a little Scottish charity called the Lunar Project, one of the biggest joys of my entire life. We are many things, an award-winning charity, completely youth-led, one of the only charities working on disability and friendship, working in bigger, bigger, and bigger and bigger circles. But above all, we are a community. All we have ever wanted is one thing, for those who come after us hope better than we did, to make these harsh systems better, soft around the edges. And I acknowledge how immensely difficult it is to change a system, how truly enormous that task is. I have sat in enough funding panels, given out enough grants to know you need more than passion to truly, really change something. But that experience has also showed me that a system is the people within it. So here's what we've done. We've written resources on dozens of different conditions, each drawn from young people with lived experience, aimed at young people. They are the only ones we've, of their kind we've ever seen. They are what we wanted to be handed way back then, and they are what many young people are handed now. We've done workshops with professionals in lots of different sectors, said, this is what it means to be disabled, said, you should treat us like more than problems to be solved, said, the smallest things to you are the biggest things to us. And I'm not bragging or exaggerating when I say that I have watched eyes light up and opinions change right in front of me. I like to think there's medical professionals and youth workers out there now who know what to say to disabled young pe people they see. We've done workshops for young people too, said, we were just like you a few years ago, said, time will make you more sure of yourself, said, you deserve the world, do not settle for anything less. And they have listened with hearts eager to be heard and the once uncertain kids have become the role models for the now uncertain kids. We have sat in virtual rooms with big and important people and been ourselves, something they're always slightly surprised by, showing up with brutal honesty and lived experience and enough pa enough passion to light the world on fire, watch the ripple effect keep, keep going way past the horizon. Felt the ripple effect in ourselves too, as we've got more confident, found who we were and what we could become, what, and took what we deserved from the world that wanted to withhold it from us. And I can only tell my own story here, and it is rooted in grant making, a world I couldn't see myself in a few years ago, but now I move naturally within it. I'll cut the jargon. The listening fund is an experiment. Essentially, it's a way to see what young people would fund given the chance, and it aims to see what funding and philanthropy sector could learn from young people, because there are multiple ways to change the system, and one of them stems from learning, to be better, to listen, to let us lead, and that they've done. Three years ago, a group of young people, 10 young people were chosen to, based on diversity of experiences, opinion and thinking, to design a fund, follow the whole process for initial ideas to final evaluation, to give out £600,000, an untenably large figure back then, but less so now. For me, the listening fund gave me a new vantage point, showed me the biggest and boldest and brightest ideas and the brilliant people making them happen every single day, showed me how difficult it is to choose for equally worthy causes, but also how broad systemic change truly is. During our evaluation visits, I visited a queer youth group and a charity committed to sociocratic decision making a week apart, and nothing has ever reminded me quite how vital this work is like that. For some young people, having a space to be themselves and an adult who cares about them is radical. For others, co-production and redefining those spaces is what they want. Both are worth far more than the funding they currently receive. The Listening Fund also taught me a lot about myself, that I could sit in a room full of adults, people I thought were vastly more qualified than me, and they would listen to me speak and they would value what I have to say. The fact I'm treated like it, as an equal in those spaces still feels something like a miracle to me now. This work taught me that I deserve to be more than I was ever told I could be and helped me to go out and get it. And in, I think, in a way, that could be systemic change too. If a system is the people who uphold it, what happens when we tip the balance? When we change who gets to occupy these spaces? When we equip a new generation of diverse young people with the tools, the language and the confidence to fight for themselves? Well, if my experience is anything to go by, I look forward to watching it, to finding out and to watching it all unfold. So I think for me, what I kind of think about a lot, having done the kind of the grassroots where we're doing a lot with the kind of money that people in bigger charities call pocket change, and then seeing all those big charities, it's been a really weird, surreal place to have two different vantage points. But I think the thing that I've always stuck with is that a system is the people 
and that changing that is the most important thing because there's been times where I've been sat with like colleagues and they've been like oh this is just firefighting this is like this is activism isn't important right now and it's never felt that way to me because the time where people are off changing a system everyone else still has to cope with the system that exists but it's all well and good changing healthcare but we all need healthcare in the meantime you know so that's kind of where I come from and yeah thank you no thank you that was brilliant um and I think that raises some really important points um around disability and also grant making as well um it's I think as someone who has run their own youth organization funding is incredibly difficult to come by especially for youth organizations um and as we've seen there have been well-established organizations such as the british youth council who have not been able to um successfully gain some more funding and it does cost young people their opportunities and um, their freedom and their voice um and so i think that's a really valuable point to take away from that as well um and definitely please put anything about the lunar project in the chat um for people um it's re i've i know i've heard of them for years and years and they do incredible work um so yes please promote them as much as possible um so yes, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and I then have to awkwardly transition to myself, um, which is something I've never been very good at. Um, so bear with me with that. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Walton, I'm 24. And I'm here today, not just as an individual, but as a testament to the power of youth social action in shaping systemic change. 10 years ago, I made the pivotal but difficult decision to leave mainstream education. At the time, it was the right decision for me and I was suffering daily from various mental health struggles. I was missing classes and I wanted to just give up on everything. Um, it was a choice that was made to protect my own mental health and to keep me safe, um, but it did not come without its own consequences. These consequences then turned into barriers and they would keep me isolated, alone and confused about my place within society. Slowly, in the following years, I began to find small joys in life to keep me going, whether that was watching the sunlight come through the windows or walking my um, my family dog with my mum or completing online courses and finding volunteering opportunities. Um, when COVID came around in early 2020, I'd already found some sort of purpose um, in volunteering within my local community. And I'd always wanted to give something back to the world after being uh, away for so long, locked in my own head. I found some reason to uh, keep going through supporting others and being the person that I needed when I was younger. And almost instantly I gained more confidence and started to gain a small community of wonderful people. Um, through young change makers and uh, partnerships and lots of other different things um, such as youth forums. Um, after a short while of volunteering and gradually growing that community I felt like I could put myself um, forward and use my lived experiences to bridge the gap that I'd noted within the education and youth systems. I founded a project aimed at young people 16 to 25 who had gone through a disruption in their education which resulted in low attainment or poor well-being. The One Third Project, as it was known, grew my community massively, um, basically overnight, um, I think, within... I I basically created it overnight. Um, I think I made the website at like two in the morning um, with my last 20 pound or something like that. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna start this, I'm gonna get it done. Um, I do all my best thinking about two in the morning. Um, and a couple months later, I'd already had hundreds of young people um, want to get involved or had already been involved in a project. Um, I think the first project I ever did was a University Mental Health Day um, collaboration project. I think that had about 40 people in that I'd obviously, I'd never known these people. I had no community previously um, from anything else. Um, and that was incredible because we had young people, we had um, education professionals, um, people that I would not have known um a couple months previously 
And so that was incredible. Um, it became a testament to the notion that every obstacle can be transformed into an opportunity for growth and impact with the right support and the space to unlock your own abilities. Since then, the One Third project has moved on um, and become a legacy for the Lead the Way Youth Summit and other projects that I've worked on over the years. I've met incredible young people, professionals from across sectors um, who have seen the transformative change of young people and how they can make an impact in different areas. Um, and I feel like I finally found my purpose. Um, throughout this journey, I've come to understand that system systemic change doesn't occur in isolation. It's a, a cumulative uh, result of collective action and advocacy. Young people in particular possess a unique capacity to challenge the status quo and amplify marginalised voices, driving meaningful change from the grassroots up. So how can young people like yourselves and those around you become catalysts for systemic change? It begins with recognising the power within your own voice and the val validity of your own experiences. Barriers and obstacles can be used to create change and opportunity and they make you unique and that uniqueness is something that the world is missing. Start by identifying issues that resonate with you personally, um, whether that's education equality, mental health provision, um, environmental sustainability. And then once you've done that, seek out opportunities for engagement, whether that's through community organisation, um, advocacy campaigns or volunteering initiatives. Um, in terms of finding those, um, I have used social media previously. Um, I would say LinkedIn can be good um, if you can sort of work through um, the the not so great um, and maybe um, less positive posts. Um, but um, in terms of connecting with people in areas that you would be interested in, LinkedIn is brilliant. Um, Instagram is brilliant. Um, there's a lot of advocacy profiles and campaigning profiles out there. Um, and I think TikTok is becoming a thing um, now for campaigning, which is great. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different things um, out there. Um, and also you can look at the, I think it's called Do It, uh, volunteering. I use them quite a few times. Um, yeah, there's lots of brilliant things out there. Um, but remember, systemic change is not a linear process. It requires patience, persistence and collaboration. Please be willing to listen and learn and amplify um, diverse perspectives. Embrace the discomfort um, as a catalyst for growth and never underestimate the ripple effect that your actions have, no, uh, however small they may seem. Um, my journey is a testament to the transform transformative power of social action, but it's also a reminder that our work is far from finished. As I embark on the next chapter of my journey, um, a pursuit of higher education and continued advocacy, I am humbled with the opportunity to empower others to find their voice and enact change. So as you leave here today, um, I urge you to reflect on the words that you've heard, the stories of resilience, courage and hope. Uh, and I remember that systemic change begins with each of us as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable future for all. Thank you. So now I awkwardly have to sort of transition onto the next thing <laughs> after my speech. Um, Please feel free, there is a link in the chat. Um, I will post it again so that anyone who had issues with the QR code can access it. Um, please feel free to send us any questions that you may have. Um, this is for um, myself, Rosella and Sophie. Um, and let's see what's coming in um we also have i'm going to stop sharing because there is a link in the chat now just so i can access this da, 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 da. okay so let's start with uh there it is. um let's start with um can you think of a pivotal moment or experience that has uh, solidified your commitment to advocacy um and um Rosella, do you want to go first uh, that's a great question but it's also really hard 
because <laughs> I think there have been multiple like small moments I wouldn't really say it for me personally there was one defining moment that sort of like my commitment but um if I had to pick one um it would probably as I said my dress be um when uh, I first went um, abroad and um, realized like how big and diverse the world was and really like different challenges that there are in different places but how closely they link to my own community like there's so many shared challenges um but are things that I experience that others experience in different ways but also the same issue like fundamentally um for example like if it's like lack of access to different systems and different um uh opportunities to connect with people in power like that's something that's shared even if someone has a completely different life to my own uh, so I think realizing that I was yeah a part of something much bigger um was probably my pivotal moment but it's very hard to define uh Sophie do you want to go next um, yeah, I think I agree with Gonzalo, it's quite hard to kind of pin down. But for me, the one that came to mind was with Luna, we were doing a workshop for some like 13, 17 year olds um, who were all on like a program to help them manage their health conditions better. And I remember like we were just casually talking about because we're all kind of 20s age. They were, talk we were talking about like uni and like working and finishing school and stuff. And they were just, you could tell that they hadn't seen anyone like similar to them managed to do that sort of thing um and like realizing like that's this is who we're fighting for you know it's it's about looking back at my own experiences but it's also about there is a kid sat in front of me on a zoom call having the exact same experience I did and it was a really surreal thing to be on the side of that oh I missed my mute button um yeah amazing um and I think for myself, um, I think attending um, the first sort of in-person speaking event for me, um, because I'd done, I'd done, at that point, I'd done years of online, similar to this, um, online events um, and building a community online. And I, that felt very within my own comfort zone. And I could control everything um I felt comfortable um I could see people face to face and it's fine um and then as soon as I it was with um the I will movement actually um they had an event in Ipswich and I was invited to do a keynote speaking um position and I was terrified because I was like oh my god I've never like I've been doing this for years and I've never done this in person I don't know if I'm going to be able to read the words right I don't know if I'm going to get my point across and I don't know how they're going to react to me um and there were so many things going in my head and I was uh full of imposter syndrome and I nearly backed out a couple times um and I did it and it was one of those moments where it's like okay well one that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be and two it actually made a massive difference and I think at that point it made me feel like I fitted in with the area that I'd chosen to go into um and it, I fitted within the community because I'd seen um you see on Instagram um there are activists that are doing brilliant stuff they're going like across the world they're doing um lots of different conferences and I up to that point I felt a bit left out like oh no I'm not doing any of those things um and whether that was through financial uh, restraints or um not fitting in certain criteria that sort of thing um I felt like I was sort of failing almost um and it's really easy to put yourself in that mindset of I'm seeing all these people doing the things I want to be doing and I'm not doing them um and I think it just resonated that even an event that I had to travel across the country for um and I was only up there for about 10 minutes maybe that was what really made me feel okay I'm in the right role I'm doing the right thing um my voice is valid and I can make a difference um and I remember trying to leave that um event and I kept getting stopped I had to leave early and I kept getting stopped by people saying oh my god that was really good and I was like um thanks um uh yes um here's the links to everything that I was talking about and I just felt so overwhelmed I was like oh my god so um yeah um I think it's it's one of those questions that's really very personal um everyone is completely different and everyone will have their own moment but 
I think it's interesting that some people's come earlier within like the first couple months of doing advocacy or a couple years later and I've heard of stories where people have done it for decades and um they're like 10 years down the line they hear of a um a case study or a story from someone and that really solidifies what they've been doing um and yeah it's really really nice um so I'm gonna stop talking now um uh next question um that's a very, very good question um so what are the key approaches attitudes and interactions um that organizations can use to make involvement in social action a positive and meaningful experience for young people so that's quite a full-on question um so sophie do you want to take that one first that yeah that's a big question um i think kind of at the, we were talking about this at the listening fund quite recently because we've been like meeting with the funders and discussing what it's been like on our side and what they've liked about like working with young people um and i think kind of the key things that we kind of discussed was flexibility because when you look at like we had a three-year contract on this role like m multiple of us have got a whole degree in three years like it's a lot it's a period of a lot of life change um we've also kind of discussed um not like uh, uh, underestimating people because like people can be like oh what can they know about funding but actually once we had everything explained to us we, we got along with it really really well um and um also just kind of being aware of imposter syndrome and um knowing that pretty much everyone in the room is going to have it um we had a really like watershed moment like 18 months into this job where once someone at a residential just sat down and went do any of you guys feel like you're actually supposed to be here and we were all like no not in the slightest um and also just as i think this especially applies to like grant making type stuff but it probably applies broader but not like not gatekeeping stuff in the sense of like some of your like boring day-to-day -day stuff might be really interesting if you haven't seen it before we had a whole thing because one of my colleagues really wanted to understand how due diligence works how like funders check that grantees are suitable and like our manager was like why do you why do you care and it was just such a weird like, argument but i think i think flexibility especially is absolutely key because there's so much happening in life and especially during this kind of period where you go from like school to uni or to moving out or all of that it's a lot <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think flexibility is really important for young people. There are just too many variables. Um, people's backgrounds completely differ. Um, you need to be able to um, make it accessible for as many people as possible. Um, I think as well, uh, making it relatable, I guess, um, in terms of obviously organisations have their own structure they have all their own policies and they will have their own way of um, doing whatever they're doing. And I think in order to make it um, accessible to young people, um, there may be young people that are brand new to um, whatever it is that the organisation is doing um, to work with young people. Um, and I think making it, not, not using too much jargon um, and making sure that it's, not simplified because it doesn't need to be that simplified but it just needs to be relatable to their community or what they've been through um and giving them the space to talk about that um and then relate it back to that um i think um i found that a few times where i have been in a youth forum or something and they've had an opening session where it's just been full of words that i've never heard of in my entire life and i think I've, I've i've seen people nodding and going yeah yeah i agree and like joining the conversation i'm like i don't I, I don't even know where to begin with this um and i've had some brilliant uh youth forum discussions of okay right we're gonna have a 10 minute 15 minute session of this is what it is um let's see how this relates to your lives and then bring you in and see where it goes from there um so i think that's really important as well um and again just communication um finding ways uh to involve young people as much as possible um and being open and honest with them about what is going to happen um there's been a few times where um i 
have been involved in things where the organisation is restricted on what young people can get involved in and they've not been open and honest about that. Um, and it sort of takes away from your impact then and it feels a bit like, OK, well, why am I here? Um, what am I going to get out of this and what am I going to um, see happen from this? Um, and I'd rather organisations, if they are restricted in that way, be open and honest and see the extent of what they can get involved in um, and see whether the young people are okay with doing that um, or whether there's something else that needs to be done, whether they need to push the barriers a bit more and open it up a bit. Um, I understand that's a bit of a restriction for some organisations, but if we can get involved um, more, that would be brilliant. Um, Rosella, do you have anything else? Honestly, I think you both have summed it up in a like, beautifully eloquent way, um, so I don't have much to add. I would just emphasise your points about accessibility. Um, being aware that different people have different ways of accessing um, like in being involved in conversations that might not be something that, like an organization would be useful so just being really open to adapting according to people's needs um, I would also say if you have the option um, of making a youth-led project like bring young people in at the very start of creating what it's going to look like um, because or any project doesn't even have to be a like a youth advocacy project but bring people in at the very start don't force an agenda on um because if you want to get meaningful engagement like co-creation co is so vital um for actually giving the change that the young people want to see um and also yeah don't go in with like assumptions i think there's still many misconceptions people have about oh if we involve young people then we can like tokenize them and like say that we've included young people um that would be great and then don't actually listen to the participants and thankfully i would like to say in lots of spaces that's becoming less of a case now that we have education and more actually active inclusion but um it's still something to be aware of um and yeah just having like regular feedback and interaction i'd say is such a great mechanism of checking you're on the right tracks and checking you're having the impact and that the young people involved are feeling valued and um, that their efforts and contributions are being acknowledged in an appropriate way yeah absolutely um i think we covered that question really well actually um uh, the next question is how can young people work to dismantle systemic barriers within their own spheres so whether that's um, a workplace or education um, yeah um, anyone want to start on that one no okay I'll go first um, I think it's a re again a really difficult question um, there are already systems set up and so the normal the normal uh thing would be to follow the processes that are already in place and it's very hard to push against that um especially if it feels like you're the only person that is sort of being affected by it i guess um and i think the best way to work towards that is by having a discussion with whoever is in charge of um those systems um and really put across what your experience of, of that is um it could be that um they've never had anyone confront them about it before and therefore this is the first time they're hearing of it and they might be very sympathetic towards um how it's affecting you and make it more flexible and adaptable to how um you're experiencing it um I, as well i would say um join societies and groups um if possible um that's a very small way but a very impactful way as well um some societies and universities and um there are clubs and schools as well um that i didn't have when i was younger but i know that there are like um environmental clubs now um and um well-being clubs and stuff like that um they're very small ways of being able to meet people who also feel um who have also gone through the same things as you and um, feel the same way and in that regard then 
if you all come collectively together and maybe um, put something forward and say, okay, we don't feel very good about this system that's in place. Um, we really need something to be done about this um, because it's affecting how we feel in work or school. Um, yeah, I think just creating communications and conversations and making some impact from that um, and following up with that. Um, I would love to hear from you guys because um, that is a really difficult question to answer. Um, I'll go with Rosella. Yeah, again, absolutely echoing everything you've just said, Anna. Um, I would say my immediate reaction to that question would be find allies and be allies um, because there are so many barriers that can be, as you said, kind of incredibly isolated. Like if you don't know others who have gone through them and are facing challenges, like I've had so many experiences where like mm -hmm. I have felt so alone. Um, well, in like in the long term, knowing that I was just the symptom of a very bigger problem, but in that very particular moment, feeling like no one understands. And if you find someone say in a workplace or in education or any aspect of life that you can talk to and know that your voice will be heard um, and they will support you even if their experience is different that is so vital and like and in turn being that person for others like having gone through those experiences myself I want to be there for others in the position like in any positions I hold so that I want I would like to be that person so that others can come to um because we're so much stronger together <laughs> that's something we've all said already but knowing that something is not like being believed um when, when you face something personal or um recognizing that someone else's experience um is still so important and needs to be like a, 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 that barrier does need to be overcome um is so important and then that's the using that to reach decision makers or again if you're a, someone who has like power or any form of influence in an organization which you will probably do in some way or form um building on that and getting others um, to be involved is i think the best way of dismantling those barriers it's like providing inclusive and space safe spaces for people to come together and work on those barriers so that you're not the only one fighting the fight um because the, the like it's so easy to feel alone in those situations and I've gone I am such an overthinker I've gone through so many situations where I thought oh that's not worth like addressing because like it's just me that's faced that if I hadn't actually found others who said like I'll support you on this then the same things would have happened to others and the problem would never even like start to be solved for a really long time so I think recognizing you're not alone and trying to find others who feel the same way is like so important yeah and Sophie do you have anything else to add to that one um I definitely echo what everyone else has said and I also think like community is very important and I also think in a way it works in kind of two ways because in dispense of unity I often find that we're simultaneously working to dismantle systems but also working how to be like within them the best way we can because no one really explains to you like what like education or employment or stuff so you often end up like over and over again the questions are like what can I get from disabled students allowance how do I apply for benefits what do I do about like this this and this and it's um it's a case of giving people information and making sure that that kind of informal networks work as well as they can to get people as much support as they can even while we're still arguing with people further up the chain um and I also will say on that, um, having allies is really important. Like um, I'm a wheelchair user, a lot, I get a lot of like access fails on things like transport. And I am often tossing up whether I complain about something where it's seriously impacted my safety or not, start of the energy. Like last weekend I traveled like on like trains and buses and I had two access fails, which would generate three different complaints. And I have one, non-disabled friend who just loves writing complaints and so she is like the absolute like gem for just helping me get that sort of thing done because I there's so many um so like that sort of like allyship and like multi communities working together is really really important amazing um please bear with me my dog is trying to get in the 
in the frame. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, a brilliant, a brilliant answer to that question. Um, we have one final question, and it's a very simple but not simple one. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to young people um, starting off in advocacy um, and activism? Um, and I'm going to go to Sophie first. I think um, kind of recognise like the importance of intergenerational connections um, as well as other young people. So quite recently, like I've been in contact with some like older disabled activists who do a lot of legal action to challenge um, like accessibility and access for failures and law breaches. And it's the kind of thing that I was like, I can, that's not for me, I can never do that. But it's actually like one of those things where it's a lot simpler to do than it looks. And like it's something that I'm now involved in. And it's really, really cool to be able to like actually do something with an access refusal rather than just tweet about it. Um, but I would never have known that without people being willing to share their experiences and give me advice and on that sort of thing. So intergenerational connections I found really valuable for learning from people who've been doing this for a lot longer. Uh, Rosella, what's your advice? That's really great advice, firstly, Sophie. Um, and I would say my advice would be start small, but think big. Um, like, I want to change so many things about our world, and I know that we all do. Um, but if I can find, like, one small thing I can do to make a difference, that will really... I, I think, Hannah, you mentioned it earlier in your address about, like, small actions have really big ripple effects. So if you start with just one thing that you think might not even have that big of an impact, it probably will. Um, and it probably will go a lot longer than further in um, tackling the issue you're focused on than you even believe. Um, and so with that being said... Don't be afraid of taking breaks and recognize the importance of your mental health when you're like focused on any issue because we're not going to get anywhere towards like having a long-term impact if you don't take care of yourself um, in whatever way and whatever form that means for you. Um, I think we're only we're still on a big like societal journey towards uh, destigmatizing mental health, which is a completely separate conversation, but making sure that you don't put all that pressure on yourself um, and feel the, the need that like you have to do it all now like yes these issues are important but you're also really important and there'll be others and you have a community that can step in and keep going when you need to take breaks so those are my that's two pieces of advice I'm sorry <laughs> no that's brilliant um that was similar to what I was gonna say um and I, th I think it is really good advice um I would say within the constraints of looking after yourself don't be afraid to take risks um it can be really scary um to put yourself out there um especially if you do choose to have some sort of social media presence or um join a community um it, it the, that initial starting of okay i don't know if i feel like i belong here yet um i just kind of want to experience it and put my experience out there and see what happens um it can be put just putting yourself out of your comfort zone can really support your yourself um and create your own confidence within a safe space and a safe community um it it really can build yourself up um and validate your experiences further um and really just show yourself what you can do um i think that's really important um but yeah, don't be afraid to be yourself. That's really cliche, um, but don't be afraid to be yourself. Um, you are the only you and you, your uniqueness is so worthy of being in the world. Um, yeah, just that was extremely cliche, but it, it, it's, it's completely true. Um, yeah, just just keep doing whatever you need to do. Um, yeah, um, that was the last question. Um, so thank you all for for being so brilliant and answering those incredibly well. Um, we're gonna do this, we've gone so quickly. I'm so sorry for anyone who was expecting a really, really long session, but I think we've covered so much um, in such a short space of time. Um, if you want to click on the link in the chat again, um, we are going to, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. 
Um, we're going to go back to the icebreaker that we did uh, earlier. Um, I'm actually going to put that on the screen so that everyone can see what their answers look like. Uh, not that. There we go. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen again. You can tell I haven't done technical things in a while. Um, uh, I'm just going to share my whole screen because that will be better. There we go. So, um, we'll, I'll po quickly pop back to what it was at the start. There we go. Um, so at the very start of the session, um, we had mostly fours. Um, we had a five for, there's different, different ways um, that young people could contribute to systemic change. Um, that's fairly self-explanatory. I was sort of expecting that anyway. Um, but I, I like that there were some fours because we can, we can build on that. Um, yeah, so barriers was the lowest one we had. So if we now skip forward, um, we've got some fives, um, which is brilliant. Um, and if you want to pop your vote in, I'm going to pop mine in as well, because um, I haven't done any of these yet. Just while everyone's doing that, again, thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, you're all brilliant. Um, and I know I'm going to keep saying that a lot, but I really don't think, I mean, everyone is completely everyone has their own experiences and therefore everyone would be a brilliant panelist, but you guys are really amazing. And I really appreciate you guys being here today. Um, yeah, we've got some really high numbers coming in. So brilliant. We, I think we've done what we needed to do today. Um, obviously this is not the end. Um, we have not just created um, the end of all um, problems in the world, but we have made a really good start of how young people can get more involved um if uh, young people are listening in how they can get involved um and obviously reach out to any of us um i feel like we're all very open and honest about our own experiences um please reach out to us and um we're more than happy to 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 answer any questions um and signpost you to different places um again there's the luna project um there's, I'm so sorry, Rosella, I've completely forgot the name of your project. Please put that in the chat for us. Um, um, Angel's on about the Nottinghamshire um, police something. I completely forgot. Um, but that will also be in the chat because I'm going to find that in a second. Um, and Sophia was talking about the I Will movement um, and different organisations. Um, so if you have a look in the chat, there's some stuff going in there at the moment. Um, yeah, numbers are brilliant. Um, so that's perfect. Um, and to end everything, there is on the final slide um, just some feedback. Um, please feel free to add some, whether it's just to say thank you to the speakers or what you would like to see next time if there's another event like this. Um, obviously, there'll also be a feedback form for the Festival of Debate themselves. Um, but if you want to just leave some feedback now, um, that is absolutely appreciated. Thank you so, so much for coming today. Um, this event has been recorded, so um, little clippets will be put somewhere um, all over the place. Um, and yeah, please be in touch with us. And again, thank you so much to Sophie, Rosella, um, Angel, Sophia, and myself, um, and also um, the Festival of, of Debate for facilitating this event for us today. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.